Hey guys, welcome to AMA number five. This one is all about photography and video. Uh, love the tips for pro detailers starting out. You said you make the videos. Do you have any tips for those wanting to do something similar? I had two other similar questions, not about um, uh, more critique. Um, what? Why do you use that mic? It's annoyingly in the way. I'll cover that one. And this one's beautiful. What's with the pink, mate? Love it. For the background color, I consulted with the creative department. It was someone I love's favorite color and that's how the decision was made. Um, I like I like purple, detail stigs purple. Um, I think it's got a royal feel to it and it can be done really well. It was a little bit pink, but um, someone was very pleased about it and that was, uh, I don't care. Their microphone, um, I we, we took that critique seriously because a few different people mentioned it and one person said get it out I think it was Carl said get it out of the the shot um, it looks hideous um, and Dan called me a poor man's Joe Rogan um, the quick the short quick answer is that having a mic really close um, gives you better quality sound the further away the microphone is the worse the, the sound quality now if you're watching these videos because you're into detailing um, and you're not into how to make uh, YouTube videos at all I still think you'll find this interesting so perhaps stick around as we usually do with our videos we insert chapters so you can skip through to sections that you're more interested in now just quickly I'll cover a little bit about myself because when I watch a video um, with the intention to learn from that person I immediately want a little bit of background on that person I'm listening to. I want to know that I'm listening to someone who's capable of doing that job. If the person is not very good at what he does, I don't want to pick up any bad habits. I, I only want to learn from someone who's very experienced and does a good job of things. So just a little bit about me and how I got here. Um, all my jobs are basically my hobbies and things that I'm interested in. Um, detailing being the first and foremost. I don't know what it is about doing that. I just, just love detailing and looking at detail. And now I think I picked up a lot of the passion and the technical expertise from my father, who was a cameraman, as they called them back then. He was also an excellent stills photographer. And the majority of his video and stills work was for the automotive industry. Now, I think my father got his passion from his father, who was a projectionist in Rome in the 50s and 60s. So I run Bespoke Imaging and I have a couple of partners that I work with and we have a very broad portfolio of work that we do. A little bit of weddings, we don't do too, too much of that. Corporate events, not too much of that either. I specialise in architecture and lately I've been shooting a lot of building materials for a well-known multinational. You can see some of my work in these brochures and one of my shots on the cover of Architecture and Design. I also won an award for a fine art image and I just have a lot of fun with photography and videography. Now, what I thought I'd start with is resetting up this scene which we set up for AMA 3 or 4, I think it was 4, AMA 4, my desk in my office. So I disassembled everything, brought it back to a desk and then filmed how to reassemble everything. And why don't we just get into it now? So this will be setting up for this scene. So as you can see here, I'm just basically getting the gist of what the composition will be and the scene. I've got a, uh, an idea in my head. Even the first time I did this, I have an idea in my head of what I want to see, which is eventually this. Not necessarily the colors or anything, but just I think in symmetry. You know, you've got this flat plane here and you've got a line here. And um, I just I'm very... Uh, inspired by Wes Anderson where it's it's very things are very flat and symmetrical I like that look now I'm not saying it's right or wrong that's just my style I like everything to be uh, have symmetry and um, be all squared off and architectural lines to be perfectly plumb never any converging verticals or anything like that so we're looking directly at the wall over the top of the desk and uh, here I'm thinking about exactly where I'll place things so things I don't want to be in frame to be out of frame here I'm finding the center point of the desk so I can set the subject up, which is me, which sometimes would be called the talent. I'm going to record most of this on the phone as well. It's a Pixel 4 XL running a Filmic Pro app, which I think was about $10. And the phone I think is worth two or $300. So here I'm just building the scene. This is the footage from the phone. It's white balanced incorrectly, which is why the walls look blue. So here's a quick grade. Uh, color's much better now looking more natural, looking correct. Back to the ugly look in case you didn't get it. 
and the graded footage back to a more natural, more pleasing, more realistic look. Bit of audio equipment here, and now the lights. I'm going for a three-point lighting system. Three-point lighting is the probably the most common way to light an interview type scene, which is I this I would call this an interview type scene. So this is a single camera with a single subject. If you had two subjects, you'd like both of them with three lights each. Three-point lighting is very a very common way to light subjects for this type of situation. And if you want a little bit more information, you can search for it. There is plenty available. Now I'm placing some lighting modifiers on the lights. What this will do is soften the light. This is a parabolic softbox. It's double diffused. So you've got two pieces of cloth in front of the light source. Then you've got a grid. So that pattern that you can see on the front, that's a grid inserted that will guide the light so you don't have any spill. I don't want any of that light to be on the background. I want it just to come and hit the subject and not be spilt onto the background. What this allows you to do is just light the subject and keep the background black, which I thought of doing, um, but that would mean if you're wearing black, it will blend in, and it also can be a little too monochromatic, which can be a little boring. So a bit of color is always necessary. Not, I don't like heaps of punchy color, so that's not too punchy, and there's a gradient, and that's not very bright at all. So I think that makes it a lot more interesting without being overdone. I've removed one of the light stands because it was a little piddly for, uh, a quite a heavy light and modifier and I've replaced it with uh, one of the big boys. I'm bringing in a table here to hold a monitor, doesn't have to be anything special, just uh, any old table will do. The monitor will allow me to see myself so I can judge composition, I don't have to be behind the camera. Also I can see things while I'm recording, I can see whether or not the camera switched off, which sometimes they do, they overheat, they run out of battery, there was something wrong. This particular camera is being run on mains power, so it shouldn't run out of battery. If I run it for too long, three or four hours, it will get too hot and it will shut down. If I see the monitor go black, I know that that's happened, so I'm not here talking to myself like a fool. The monitor also allows me to change light position and um, and shape light and do things and see what the actual result will be. I use a mannequin usually. You can see here I've got a mannequin's head. This is so I can switch the lights on and see what kind of light I'm getting on the subject's head. I, obviously that mannequin is replaced with me later on. Uh, I've got something to focus on and I can see the way the light is wrapping around what will be my head. I've included this footage of setting up the camera mainly for people who want to know all the individual settings, uh, what camera I'm using and how it's set up. I'll put as much of this information in the uh, video description, but if I've missed something or you want to know more, just ask and I'll answer those questions for you. Now we're setting up the audio gear, so we're using balanced cables so that we don't have any noise or interference. They're going to a standalone field recorder. This is not anything real special, not expensive, uh, but it's more than good enough for these type of productions. It's very simple, very small, the file sizes are manageable, and the audio quality is beyond what we need for a production like this, but I kind of like to give myself a little bit of space. What, the, what capturing good audio does is allows you to fix any problems. So we do a little bit of noise reduction. There is an air conditioner running. There is wind and other noises. There are cars that are driving past on the street. And having a lot of data gives me the ability to kind of heal things that I don't want out. Also, as we said before, good audio is so, so, so important to a production. Most of the best people in the industry have stated Audio is 50% of the production. Video can be average, but audio must be, must be very good for people to want to continue to listen to your production. You can skimp on cameras and use a phone, but you never ever skimp on audio. Now we switched on this uh, practical light here. But as I thought, the globe is far too hot, too bright. There's too much spill in the background because I've decided I'm gonna color the background. This is the phone footage. Now you can see the setup from my point of view. So you can see the camera that I'm talking to and you can see how I can see myself so I can keep an eye on things. If I had a production assistant, the monitor would be flipped around and he or she would be monitoring things from behind the camera. Yeah, that light's just too bright. So I've removed the bulb. It's just an Ikea light and Ikea bulb, by the way. The color was good. I like the color, but it's just far too bright. I'm going to insert one of these handy little lights. You can find them from various brands. This is a bicolor light, 
which means I can achieve an incandescent or yellowish light source and adjust it through daylight to a very cold and blue. And now we have a light where we can control the color, the, the output in terms of the, uh, the intensity, the brightness. We can even diffuse it a little to make it broader, softer, harder, uh, shaped better. Um, but just whacking that up in there, I, I'm running it at 10% power and at 2700 Kelvin gives us this nice soft glow. It, it is a practical light, it is doing something, but there's no spill on the background and I just think it adds something to the scene. It's not plain plain here. It's um, just this, there's something there. So that, um, that light which is used as a light is now, it can now be used as a practical for these productions with this much more manageable light source up inside it. For the background I'm going to use another a similar little pocket sized light with RGB diodes. I'm going to cycle through the mix of RGB until I find the colour I like, set the intensity and saturation, and fit that to a little magic arm on a tripod just behind me. Normally if you didn't want to see the lighting in the scene you wouldn't have it there, but it's being blocked by me. Yeah, she is pretty neat. These little pocket lights are inexpensive and they're so, so useful. You can pick them up for about $100 each. They've got lithium-ion batteries inside them. You can charge them via USB-C. I'd plug them into the laptop or into the wall socket or whatever. Um, they can even run off uh, power banks um, and you can run them for virtually forever. They're great inside cars. They go on top of cameras. They're magnetics. They stick almost everywhere. As you can see, they're just so, so, so useful. That one I probably wouldn't use for accurate skin tones. I'd get a chip on board light, a proper light, or something a little bit more expensive than a $100 pocket light. But as long as you're not using it for skin tones, they are fantastic. And using it for color like this, just awesome. So I've got that color and I've got the gradient I want. I bring the mannequin back in now and we start to shape the light. You can see here, if I move the light around, that parabolic softbox around, I'll get spill on the background and I'll wash out the background light. And if I move it too far forward, I'm not lighting up the subject anymore. So I can get it just in the right position and I can see all this because I'm looking at the monitor. And here I'm just fine tuning exposure. Those diagonal black lines you can see are called zebras and they're telling me how parts of the scene are exposed. Now the table can be overexposed, I don't want it completely blown out, but I want it to be white like it is. And I want to make sure my skin tones are 70 IRE. IRE, in case you are interested, is International Radio Engineers. And an IRE of zero is pure black, and 100 is clipped white. Clipped means blown and overexposed, you're not going to pull any detail out of that. So you have to keep things between zero and 100 IRE. Now I'm bringing some of the footage into the computer just to check, do a quick grade. Looks good. Just going to adjust the position of that light and try and make it plumb. Now I'm going to bring some footage in of me, run that grade over the top of it to see if it looks good. I look good. And I'm pretty happy with the way things are looking, so we're going to press record and talk to the camera. Now before I said the audio was really important, and I meant that. However, I do understand that a seven or eight hundred dollar mic, a one hundred dollar boom, a couple of XLR cables, um, a five hundred dollar recorder, etc., starts to add up quickly. So you can use a shotgun mic, something like a Rode video mic would be good, mounted on the hot shoe on top of the camera and plug it directly into the camera. That will save most of this setup and you'll still get pretty good sound because that mic is directional and it's significantly better than the onboard camera mics which you're listening to now. If you are going to take my advice and use a field recorder, which I recommend you do, you'll want to start off the scene by syncing. This allows us to take the audio from the audio recorder and take the video from the camera and line them up in post and sync them in post. Now you can have the audio recorder talk to the camera, but I don't usually do that. I find syncing is very, very easy. What we just did is what you'd find um, the, the job of a, a clapper to do. So you've seen in movies, clack. That makes a very loud noise that all the microphones hear that the camera can see and they can use that point where that clapper came down and the noise and that's how you sync the audio to the video. Now the audio you can hear is from this mic through the field recorder. It's been normalized which means we just basically uh, give it more gain and just, just raise the volume up a little bit. It's been EQ'd just slightly. This is pretty good straight out of the, um, the, the recorder but just a little bit of EQing for my particular voice. 
and I apply a tiny amount of noise reduction which I almost always find I have to do. In this case it's for that air conditioner which is just six feet behind me. If you have to run an air conditioner, run the fan on a particular setting so at least it's stable and at the start of your scene have a bit of room noise. It's basically just silence and you're gonna take that noise and you're gonna feed it into the computer and tell the computer that that is background noise. Please remove that from the rest of the audio clip and you're left with much, much, much cleaner audio which is nicer to listen to. So there's five parts for setting up a video. They're setting up the scene, the composition, there's lighting, in this case we went for three point lighting. There's audio, again, the most important part. There's the content, which is the second most important part. There's no point having great visuals and audio if no one wants to hear what you have to say. And the fifth and last part is all the post-production work on the computer. Now I'm not gonna go into the post side of things because that'll chew up a lot of time and you can find all that information online and you can, uh, you, it's not as difficult to learn as you might think. However, if you really feel like you need to have me uh, explain my particular process or you just you just like to hear that, um, I, I might entertain that idea. And we'll, but we'll put it in, if we do, we'll put it in another video. Now for stills, it's really much of the same thing. You set up a scene, you have a kind of a vision of what you want to do. You set up the, the vehicle in a particular environment or in a particular way. You light that scene the way you would light this scene. You don't have to worry about the audio, so that's good. And the content is actually still there. You're still telling a story with that photo and you still have to uh, uh, make sure you've got some emotion in that, that photo. Nobody wants to see the same old still photograph or a boring photograph. It has to have something that makes people stop and want to look at it. Because without that emotive element, there's no reason to be looking at that artwork. So in conclusion, you can keep these things very simple and, and affordable and they're, they're actually easy. If, if it seemed um, complicated, that's probably because I was getting into the nitty gritty a little too much, but you can, you can learn this and you can get over the technical know-how. You can set these things up for anywhere between say two and $15,000, depending on how nuts you want to go with the equipment. This particular setup is $10,000, including the computer. I encourage you to check out their final inspection Flickr account, especially if you're interested in automotive only photography. There's a link in the description and there is a thousand images carefully organized into different albums that you can peruse and they all have, or most of them would have, EXIF data attached. You also don't have to do this yourself if you want one of these videos and you just think, wow, that's too much work to go to, or I don't want the outlay and I don't want to have to do all the, 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 the technical understanding and uh, learning a, a camera and learning post-production and things like that, because it is quite a steep learning curve. You can call Bespoke Imaging and we can do these for you. It's, uh, what, if you if you like this production and you think I'd like what Final Inspection has, you can call Bespoke Imaging and probably me will come out and do what we do for Final Inspection for you. The only thing that I would advise is to do it differently. And lastly, if you need any more questions answered, feel free to um, ask them. Just leave a comment and I'll try my very, very best to reply. I'm enthused about this stuff, so generally I'll be enthused about answering your questions. And I actually like discussion with other photographers and videographers. And again, if you're not going to film or take any photos, I just thought you as a final inspection customer would find this interesting to see uh, the work that we do for you um, that's not on the car side, that's not in the workshop. I really hope you enjoyed it. Have a great night. See you soon.